In today's discipleship, you may have noticed, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. Genesis chapter 10 and Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at five ancient kingdoms, and this is very interesting on in the future about the Antichrist and end times and a reflection of our modern era. As I've emphasized so many times, what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Amen. So we're going to look at some very interesting stuff during this time. So during this timeline, we know that the Tower of Babel, that was where all different nations started to split from And then when they split, they started to spread out through different nations. This was an attempt by Nimrod. As you might recall, Nimrod, he tried to attempt something in building up a new world order system. However, the Lord made sure that it fell apart. And because it fell apart, all sorts of people started to spread out through different nations. But Nimrod wanted to make sure that even though people would be spreading all around the world, that his worship system would be carried. So Nimrod introduced Babylon religion, and then the one who furthered it was Semiramis. Now let's talk about what happened during this time. There are two key people that I pointed out who were very significant during this timeline. And it's a conflict throughout the entire Bible. It's Shem and Ham. These are two races that made up the bulk of your Old Testament. And there was a lot of conflict between Shem's group and Ham's group during this Tower of Babel timeline. I want you to understand that. That's going to be very significant. I told you that, according to some ancient accounts, Shem is the one who killed Nimrod and dismembered him. And the dismembering kind of matches up with the book of Judges, where they were uh, spreading out different body parts out of great vengeance. And they tried to do it for a righteous reason. Now, what's important to understand is that during this timeline, where Shem and Ham were always in conflict, Ham's people and Shem's people, we're going to see what happened with their conflict, their conglomeration, and then it developed into a powerful nation, which is why your pastor mentioned so many times the Lord what he wanted to do was divide the nationalities. He did not want them to conglomerate because he knew the dangers that it would unfold. Now, obviously our church is an international church, but that's because we're in a different dispensation. God, how he looks at us, is not outwardly on our nationality, but actually by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. However, concerning a secular, worldwide, physical point of view, not a spiritual, blood-washed point of view, he sees from a physical, fleshly standpoint, it's best that mankind do not unite. Why? Once they unite, there's compromising, toleration of different pagan beliefs, and then it develops into a new wrong system once more. Okay, so let's look at some interesting things over here. Now, I'm going to be reading quite a lot from Frederick Widowson's book, A Bible Believer Looks at World History. As you might recall, I recommended you uh, to buy this one. It was not necessary, but I highly recommend it to buy it because it would explain a lot of our world history that I'm going to be teaching so first of all, we know that the nations were divided, and they carried some form of Nimrod's worship system. What's very interesting, first of all, is remember, because I'm going through world history, I'm going to be covering 
the critic side of the argument, right? Yeah. Now, the critic side of the argument is that they cannot deny some form of what they call quote unquote primitive group of people. And I was shocked, but if you study cultural anthropology, cultural anthropology, that's the study of man based on different cultures. Now, you want me to tell you something wild that I learned in cultural anthropology? And this professor, believe it or not, he taught evolution and also witchcraft in the school. I'm not, I'm not lying. She taught witchcraft in the college campus. And kids are signing up like that's a cool thing. Wow. So even a wicked form of extreme like that, she could not deny this. In the cultural anthropology textbook, they have to admit this. Before people, uh, how did we evolve in different languages, right? She admits this, that back then, there was a primitive group of people that seemed to have one form of language back then. And then, this is even more interesting, something happened. That's what they always say. Uh -huh. Something happened. Yeah. Something happened where they started to split off into different languages. Some of that. Now, I was like thinking automatically while I was reading the textbook that this proves the Bible then Amen. about the Tower of Babel. But it's like the scholars knew that what they were writing would fulfill scripture, so they quickly wrote a disclaimer. This is not to say that everyone was in a big city that time. Because Nimrod, he's ruling over a, a huge kingdom that time where all the world was united. So it's like they were predicting. They said it was most likely through several, it was more complicated than that. It wasn't simplified at one region. It was throughout different local communities who used to be a one language. And then when they start to spread out, that's when more complicated, diverse languages spread. Why do they have to say that? They have to say that because they don't want to support the Bible. They don't want to support the Bible. So I thought that you'd find that interesting. Another thing concerning this timeline is we're going to look at several groups of people. We're going to look at the book of Genesis. And then when you look at chapter 10, verse 22, Genesis chapter 10, verse 22, the children of Shem, correct? Who's the first child of Shem that is mentioned? This shows so much how the Bible is predicted. It's always ahead of time. The first per person that it would mention is Elam. Isn't that very interesting? Now, why would your King James Bible mention that person's name first out of all sorts of different groups of people? The reason why is, according to our friend over here, when he wrote about the ancestry of Shem when they were spreading out, he says over here that the first great ancient nation, listen up now, Usually the first great ancient nation that is mentioned throughout history is Egypt, which is why they depend a lot of their dating methods on that. I taught you that already. I'm not going to teach it again. And the second one is actually Sumeria. So you might recall that one. I, I only indicated Sumeria because I am going to be talking about Sumeria today, actually. So Sumeria is the most ancient kingdom, and more so compared to Egypt. So Samaria and Egypt should be recalled for your history. They are the most ancient kingdoms that you want to remember. So we, we covered Samaria, it was mentioned, and then Egypt was also mentioned. But guess what? There's a kingdom that's more ancient than these two, and that is Shem. Not Ham's lot. It's Shem, Elam. That's pretty interesting. It seems to show where God is 
pointing out history to be more important. He wants to go to the good guys, not to the bad guys. So, Elam's kingdom is the most ancient, and then Samaria will be mentioned shortly thereafter. So, Elam, according to Widowson over here, he mentioned the first great ancient nation we have to deal with this is known as the Elam. Its center was a city named Susa. It is one of the oldest advanced civilizations for which we have found archaeological evidence according. Now, Widowson's textbook, the reason why I rely a lot on this is because he quotes a lot of historical sources when he's explaining history. And then he even puts the bibliography and the references for the naysayers over there. So all you have to do is just check it up. And he's all for that, actually. He mentioned, he's such a critical thinker that he mentioned that it's better where you people look it up yourselves yeah. rather than just believe it. And he even acknowledged where his law may have diverted in some historical things. So this guy, he's being, he's also quoting a lot of liberal education history, not because he believes it, but because he strongly believes Bible believers need to be aware of this, that way we can filter out what's true history and wrong history. You don't want to just be shown out of the blue by some liberal educator of his historical proof and you have no idea. So that's why Widowson combined a lot of this together. He, he claims this according to Durant, the Story of Civilization, Our Oriental Heritage, Volume 1. That's again based off of Durant, D-U-R-A-N-T. The modern Iraqi town of Shushan is close by, but much of Elam was in present-day southwestern Iran. Elam was a child of Noah's son Shem, first mentioned in Genesis 10.22. The Elamites were found to have, according to Durant, so Durant proves this. They have copper, weapons of tools. They also have grains, domesticated animal, hieroglyphic writings, business documents. They also have mirrors and jewelry. And what's very interesting is that they had a trade. They had a trade that went from, let me look it up real quickly over here. They had a trade that went from India to Egypt. Wow. So oh, yeah. this, this <laughs> civilization, during that time, you can see mankind is already making strides already, right? Already making strides on the development of their society. We know Egypt is extremely important in our history, but you're going to also find out India is going to be probably the, the most important nation for Asian history when you study. So, India and China. But I believe India is more so. Why? Because India is more of the intermediate route toward the biblical ancient kingdoms, toward the Orient side, toward East Asia. Uh, we will come back to India one day. Let's cover these ancient kingdoms that time. So this is all Shem's kingdom during that time. They, uh, Bienkowski and Miller's Dictionary of the Ancient Near East, that's the name of the dictionary, Dictionary of the Ancient Near East, they claim the Elamite language is unrelated to any known ancient language. You know why? Because this is very important. Now, I want you to remember this because this is very important for critical lenses when you study history, etymology. You need to know your etymology. Amateurs who criticize errors in the King James Bible, they don't know the complicated transition and gradual changes within our languages, which is why the King James Bible wording is accurate at its present time. Not only that, today's modern century, how we Americans keep changing our language 
is not going to match with the King James Bible sort of language as well. So you can't try to accuse the King James Bible about, well, it mentions corn, and uh, because of the Mandela effect, there must be something going on with the King James Bible. And there was no, uh, and then they come up with these weird arguments, but if you look up corn through the etym etymological roots, then you can find out that the Mandela effect is easily debunked. Yeah, amen. Modern Bible translators, as well as the Mandela effect people, what they don't do is use etymological studies concerning about where the Bible talks about bottles in the four Gospels of Jesus Christ. They claim that it, there's no such thing as a bottle that time. It was wine skins and etc. <laughs> so all you have to do is just study the etymological roots of what the King James Bible uses by the mean of bottle. And not only that, if you study the etymological root, you'd be surprised that there was some form of bottle, yeah. according to some theological theology scholars, believe it or not. That's good. So, uh, but I'm just spelling out everything. I've got to zoom on. Otherwise, we're stuck here, right? So this is Elam. Now let's cover Sumeria. Sumeria is mostly Ham's territory. So Ham, modern liberal education scholars, the out of the three sons of Noah, that they will pay most significant attention toward and base their education off of is the nation and the sun that God looks down the most, and that's Ham. Now, when you see that, that means that there's something wrong with this liberal education system. Because all the way at the beginning, God already told you, no, this is cursed, whereas Shem is blessed. So you would go to Shem, obviously. But then Ham, it's so weird how Satan likes to pay a lot of attention to Ham's people. You know why? Satan always wants to do the opposite of God's intentions, right? Now, Sumeria, they were a civilization south of Babylon and southwest of Elam. So they were south of Babylon and Elam. Now, called, so Sumeria is called after a derivation of the word, guess what? Shinar. Mm. Now, remember, where did Nimrod come from? Where did Babylon come from? Right here. Remember the epic of Gilgamesh? Where did that come from where it's basing off of Nimrod? It comes from Sumeria. So they put a lot of deification or admiration, either or, to Nimrod. Because that's Nimrod's territory making up the most ancient kingdom of that time. This is again documented by Widowson's book over here. Now look at this. This is what liberal scholars will do to, um, to make sure that they invalidate the Bible. They're going to look up ancient pagan nations that are older than your King James Bible. And then they're going to try to say, so see, all these Bible stories are all from this back then. They're a bunch of amateurs. Okay. The Sumerian poets wrote about creation, a flood, and a lost paradise, but not being inspired or in God's will. They altered it and created a great fantasy, which unbelieving historians claim for the original of the Judeo-Christian Bible's account. Now, you know how you can disprove this. How you can disprove this, obviously, is all you have to do is just look at the Sumerian myth. Read it and read Genesis and see what makes the most archaeological, historical, and scientific, and even common sense sense. Amen. That's all you have to do. And then you know that it's ridiculous where the Bible borrowed its uh, nonsensical ideology, illogical fallacy. From the pagan nations at that time. That's important to understand. Another thing is this is that just because 
you have something that's written by Samaria that's, mo that's most ancient, it doesn't mean it's the most accurate. Now that's the problem with manuscript evidence scholars. Once they find the oldest manuscript, they believe that should be the most accurate. Well, no, the opposite is actually true. Amen. If it's retained, if it's archaeological evidence, the writing is retained, it shows how much it was most unused. It shows how much people didn't think that it was that important to open up and read. Did you ever take out a book? We can tell which books that you pay more attention that's to right. when something's more worn out, not something that's more retained. Amen. That's the illogical thinking and rationale that makes up what? The entirety of your history and archaeology. So you really trust the liberal education system, huh? With their archaeology and history? You can't do that. Uh, another thing to think about is this. Think about two specific, the most powerful groups of people that continue throughout all of history. It's Israel. It never died out. All pagan nations went extinct. Amen. Israel continued. Why? Because this account was taken more accurate Amen. by the majority of people. And guess what? Christian accounts. Christianity. That's why Satan had no choice but to what? Conglomerate his evil system with the nation of Israel and the Christian church. So we got the whole stinking myth of Catholicism and Jewish bankers, Rothschilds, etc. People don't use their heads. Alright, so I'm explaining all this so you can know how to debunk the critics when they tell you to talk about ancient history, okay? It would be very helpful. Now, Sumerian king lists, their lists extend their history back over 400,000 years with kings named, guess what, with kings named Tammuz and Gilgamesh. Remember Tammuz? Yeah. Or did you forget his name? Tammuz, remember? He's the guy that was the offspring of Semiramis. How about that? This is Nimrod's territory on Dabu. The Sumerians were constantly trying to fend off attempts, both successful and unsuccessful, at invasion by who? Can you guess which, which group? Obviously, Shem, the Semites. So obviously from them, we can see that they always had, uh, Sumeria had this conflict with Shem's people during that time. One of the things that they mention over here is that the Sumerians did not refer to themselves as Sumerian, which is interesting. Their language eventually became like what? You know what? What's very interesting? What Samaria's language eventually became? The Roman Catholic Church. What do they believe was the was the superior, like God's language? Latin. They don't want some semi language. So the Catholic Church, they always persecuted the nation of Israel. So you better watch out for that anti-Semitic stuff. Amen. That's something that you're contributing to the real conspiracy of this. Mm -hmm. You better watch out for that. When you look at certain Jews involved in the conspiracy, that's not the entirety of the nation of Israel. Those are powerful Jewish figures. And obviously you're going to see powerful Christian figures who are part of the conspiracy realm. That doesn't validate Christianity as a whole. you got to look at the Bible, what conspiracy has the good guys and the bad guys. Now, they mentioned that Elam and the Hamanic Amorites battled with Samaria before Hammurabi, king of Babylon, finally invaded them. So Hammurabi, that's another important name that you want to know. So we'll come across him later on as we cover Babylon. But you notice that Sumerian is very much transitional, a lot of the, the roots is shared with the kingdom of Babylon. 
That's why God hates Babylon so much. All right. So Hammurabi conquered it later on. What they mention over here is that Sumeria was similar to Egypt. It had uh, the overflow of great rivers and series of canals. Durant would also mention that uh, their art was simple. Greatest known written work was obviously Epic of Gilgamesh. And this was probably written by Sargon of Akkad. Now, Akkad is another ancient group. So what you want to know about Sumeria, as we come across Hammurabi and the other people, is not only little bits of Babylon, but it's also conglomeration of Akkad. And Akkad is not Hamitic. You know who they're from? You already see this conglomeration going, right? You see that coming? Suddenly. And all you have to do is give it a large amount of time and you can create a monster system called Babylon, the great whore of Revelation, for centuries and millennia. All about that. So it's a conglomeration. What's important to understand when you study these ancient kingdoms, you're going to see a lot of them sharing with other kingdoms. You know why? Because it seems like mankind didn't learn their lesson. When God split the Tower of Babel, Nimrod gave a unification of a religious form, and then not only that, people, they tried to meet each other. And then when they meet each other, they marry uh, a different nationality, and then they produce a new, uh, a new form of race after that. That's why there are so many different nationalities today. Because all that come from the roots of Shem, Han, and Japheth. But it's not cleaned off like you think. It's a, it's a complicated system where there's a lot of intermingling going on. Intermingling did not go, did not begin with the nation of Israel. It was one long time ago. Where do you think the Jews learned intermingling from? When God wanted them to separate yourself. Because he saw these ancient kingdoms at that time. So Akkad's a Semitic group that combined with Sumeria. They made Gilgamesh as Genesis 6, Superman, mighty men of old, men of renown, that matches with Babylon. The Sumerian worshipped, this is very interesting, what is the main number one nation that you know this pagan nations worship? You got now remember who represents the sun when we studied our history? These guys. But remember, they're trying to replace Jesus Christ, who mentioned at the book of Malachi that he is the son of righteousness, arise with healings in his wings. So they're twisting it, you notice. Let me read this quickly. Sumerian worshipped the sun as Shamash, the light of the gods. They especially worshipped the virgin earth goddess Inini, known to the Akkadians as Ishtar. So, so the Akkad took the female deity worship from Semiramis. See that? Imrah succeeded. His worship system succeeded, where Shem was getting messed up with that. Israel had a strange and bad infatuation going to some form of Babylonian Nimrod religion. Inini, known to the Akkadians as Ishtar, Easter, who became known later as Aphrodite, Demeter, Minerva, Ceres, Diana, Sibel, the Virgin Mary, with names like Lady Liberty, and the goddess of immigrants, I'm sorry that I knocked your idol. <laughs> There's some people who are earthly patriotic, I'm sorry. They also worship the sorrowful mother goddess Ninkarsa, who interceded with the gods for them. That sounds like the Virgin Mary, interceding as a female deity. They worship Tammuz, the god of vegetation, who died and was reborn. Trying to imitate Jesus Christ. 
Now remember, Semiramis claimed that Nimrod died and Tammuz was a resurrected form, reincarnated form. And the Antichrist is going to imitate that. Sin, the moon god, with the crescent moon over his head, is worshipped. Much later, he becomes, obviously, who? Allah of the Muslims. Mm -hmm. To the Sumerians, the air was full of spirits. Good angels, with each Sumerian having one to protect him or her, and demons or devils trying to get rid of the protective deity and take possession of body or soul. It was common for women to be consecrated for temple duty as a wife of the gods. Speaking of women, they were nearly, listen up, you know where equal rights for the feminist movement came from? Speaking of women, they were nearly equal with men in regard to rights. Wow. Interesting. But there is a... a in the cultural sense, it is totally ingrained where there's obviously some form of man being the Lord as well. So that is still very much ingrained. But of course the man was Lord and Master, and adultery for a woman was punished by death. Okay, you know where one city that came out of Samaria? This is important, and we're going to cover the good guys later on. I'm going to speak a little bit faster. So much gold, right? Amen. Ur of the Chaldees wow. is one of the most important cities that came from Samaria, but it became more official when Babylonia took over. Who came from there? Everyone. So the title of this video is not just the five pagan, pagan it's not just the five ancient kingdoms. There was one nation God was sick and tired that he had to develop a new nation. That was Israel. That's why he started Israel. See that? Man, history is amazing. Okay, now let's uh, cover some interesting things concerning about Egypt. There are two people that you want to occasionally read for uh, historical sources. He uses Usher. Now, remember I mentioned Usher? That's where Schofield Reference Bible, Ruffin Reference Bible, a lot of Bible-believing scholars use the timeline of Usher. The second one is Herodotus. Now, I don't know if you remember, but I did quote one or two from him concerning his view, I think, about demons. So, Herodotus. So, these are two sources that you can read concerned about the ancient timeline of Egypt. Now let's cover the, the most powerful ancient kingdom that time. That's Egypt. That's why God does not see Egypt as gone. He sees it at Revelation 11 that Egypt will be revived and resurrected. God never forgot about Egypt. All right, how it starts is this, is that what they claim concerning about Egypt is that it goes from different timelines and dates where there's a lot of controversy. Now, you notice, uh, I would recommend uh, visiting the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum, and then when you go over there, it's very interesting. We know that's a lot of dark stuff, right? Yeah. But if you go over there, this is how they date Egypt. What they do is they, they go by dynasties. Dynasties is how they find the timeline of who's more ancient, what timeline in history they fit. That's important. A second thing concerning about Egypt is that they divide it into Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and then they're going to cover it with the Later Kingdom or the new kingdom. And then what the new kingdom is going to entail is that's where the other four powers came much later. During the ancient timeline, we see wow. three superpowers. And it's not these three, actually. These two are the most ancient. This is the first ancient power. I'm going to show you the, the other two. The three most ancient powers during that time, one of them was Egypt, and you'll see it pop up in Daniel's timeline where the next ancient powers, which we all know is Babylon and Persia and Greece, 
and Rome. And that's where the new kingdom of Egypt continued. But Egypt was very weak that time, and we know why. Because it has to take an act of God to judge the prosperity and the achievements of technology, civilization of a pagan nation to get them to learn their lesson. Does that reflect something about today? Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. Did you ever? Okay. I'm, Come on. Real quick. Mm -hmm. If I told you 10 years ago that despite of the advancement of technology today that we're achieving and we're better than the Christians and we can overcome and we can make ends meet. If I told you 10 years ago that despite of all that, you're going to see in the year 2020 people fighting over toilet paper. Um, yeah. What do you think people will do back 10 years ago? They'll laugh at you. Yeah. They're like, this is such easy means. And look at this COVID-19 outbreak. Yeah. Isn't this amazing? Yeah. This is God's sense of humor to teach mankind. You can't even, you you guys even fight for the most basic resource. Wow. Yeah. Despite wow. your advancement of machine, science, technology. Oh. That's why it's called science. Amen. So why don't you use that to your atheists and your agnostics who God deifies science so much? <laughs> Do you know who survived throughout every catastrophe? Well, Christianity. Amen. Because we have something more solid than science. Amen. Alright, I'm done with my That's preaching. Good. <laughs> I should preach on that for a long time. Okay, so how Egypt began supposedly, according to Usher, is the march of Menes and Mizraim. And when he marched over there, it began human life. And then their dates contradict, obviously, in Egypt. So I don't have to cover that one. Now, what's pretty interesting is that the oldest known Egyptian building is the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. And that's a tomb. It's not a tower or something spectacular. It's a tomb in Egypt. You know what the Bible concludes in Genesis about Egypt? Joseph was buried, Genesis chapter 40, at, at, chapter 40, at a what? Coffin in Egypt. They emphasize a lot about the dead. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now, when you dabble with that stuff, run. Yeah. Run. I feel a lot about the dead over here. That's something satanic. It started with something satanic, as you can see. You'll also notice that um, traditional historians, they tell us that the first great king of Egypt was Khufu. That's what they claim, around 2500 BC. He's a tyrannical and a pyramid builder. He's the one, supposedly, that got all these people to build the pyramids. Supposedly, the great pyramid attributed to Khufu, or Cheops, another name for him. There are two and a half million blocks some of them weighing 150 tons, all of them averaging two and a half tons, covering half a million square feet area and rising nearly 500 feet in the air. Scientists named Bubble will notice that the three pyramids on the Giza Plateau are lined up perfectly with the belt of the constellation, the Hunter Orion, who ancient mythologists also knew as what? Nimrod. Nimrod. It's all Nimrod over here. Clyde Ross disputes this and claims that the three pyramids correspond to the size relationship between Mars, Venus, Earth, and Mercury, etc., etc. And what's uh, interesting is that uh, in spite of no one finding one shred of evidence on the Giza Plateau, that the ancient Egyptians knew anything spectacular about astronomy. So they take it by faith. Why? Because there couldn't be a god for it. There couldn't be a son of God of fallen angels. It had to be these humans. So what makes the most logical sense will have to be this king. How are you going to make that sense to match with the constellation, man? Yeah. Unless you believe in the Bible, well, and these Egyptians claim that the gods came down and taught them. Yeah. Now, so then, the pyramids can come out with several theories how they were built. Okay, so here's some interesting stuff. But let's divide the dynasties over here. Da, 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 da. Egyptians lived and died based on the seasonal flooding of the Nile River for growing crops like Sumeria. 
So we know the river, water was a god to the people at the pagan times. Which is why God saw the importance of water to the people, so he practiced water baptism as part of salvation for the nation of Israel. And then he will revive it later on during the Antichrist system. But that's a whole other story. The priests of the Egyptian gods were very powerful, and along with the pharaoh and the nobles kept order. They were responsible. Now this is not all of this that I'm going to talk to you is going to reflect ancient Catholic medieval uh, history as well as modern liberal education. They're reflecting Egypt. That's why God says don't go back to Egypt to the Jews. You're going to learn a bunch of God from them. The priests were powerful. They were responsible for the oldest public education system of which we know in temple school. Wow. Royal incest was common to keep dynastic power intact, but it was not so among the common people. You can see a great level of medicine. They even majored a lot in medicine, actually. Very interesting stuff. Now, when the Bible talks about the pharmacy, and then you look at a, the etymological root from Greek, that's something where it's demonic. That's something demonic. Look that up. So why? Because Egyptians, uh, they combine medicine with spiritism. They believe that they have a point. If you're sick, then that means it's because some de demonic spirit or some form, uh, some form of evil fell upon you, actually. So they combine medicine with something religious. Something also interesting over here, there, a lot of it can be documented in papyrus fragments about their medicine, their secret ingredients. That's something you might want to look up to. Mm -hmm. Who deifies the papyrus manuscripts? Manuscript, evidence, modern, scholar. Yeah. You notice this men never learn from history. Now, the reason why I'm taking such a long time on this one is I'm trying to compare this with modern day era so that people can learn a lesson. Oh, I'm sorry. You still don't. Okay. You bunch of dumb, stupid humans. Yeah, amen. amen. That includes you. Bless God, amen. amen. I'm amen. the chief of sinners, as Paul said. Now, what's very interesting is that they also majored in math, music, now, this is very interesting. In any event, Egypt was using glass ornaments, putting on plays in temples. That's where Hollywood theater came from. Egypt. You notice Egypt is the hellhole that gave birth to a lot of garbage. Mm -hmm. Playing fuse, string lyrics from Asia, and drums from Africa. Oh, wait a minute, who combined drums with their wow. cultural age music from Africa? Contemporary music, your favorite rock, rap, jazz, and whatever, swing, bebop. Ah, 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 ah. How about that? And Christians say this is used for the glory of God. Don't go back to Egypt. Oh. You know what? I can just base a whole sermon on this. Yeah, called amen. Don't Go Back to Egypt and Knock Off Education knock off um, Hollywood, knock off the music industry, and knock off the religious priest elitism. Oh, and the, 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 Okay, anyways, let's go. Ba, 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 ba. There are some interesting notes over here. They used monkeys to claim fruit from trees, beekeeping hives and all. That's interesting. Sophisticated navy with large plank boats. Canals to bypass impassable areas of the Nile, though, no, though not as extensive as the Sumerians. Water clocks, sophisticated linen manufacture for clothing. Uh, beer brewing also came from Egypt as well. Basic dentistry. And some Christians think that uh, drinking beer is biblical. Yeah. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't go back to Egypt. <laughs> Amen. Posting it on stupid Facebook and YouTube and of it. trying to get modern teenagers hyped up about Calvinism because I'm not saying all Calvinists, but some wicked Calvinists trying to get uh, Christians to drink alcohol. It's okay. Wicked. Don't go back to Egypt. 
Apparently, the use of tobacco as well. Wow. Why? By forensics works done on the body of Ramesses, though, which is very interesting. Much more evidence about all this can be taken from ancient inventions. Ancient inventions. And that's by Peter James and Nick Thorpe. Peter James and Nick Thorpe. There's so much on Egypt that I can cover, but there's not enough time over here. Scholars of Egypt were mostly priests who enjoyed the comfort and security of the temples, much like our tenured professors enjoy the comfort and security of our many colleges and universities, and like the Catholic priests back then, during the Inquisition. Not much different. You know, everybody, uh, when they talk about philosophy or wisdom or high education, who's the first person that they think about? They go back to Socrates. Mm -hmm. But Socrates ain't the first guy. And secular historians will have to admit this when they study Egypt. These priests laid the foundation for Egyptian science, which the Greeks confessed was the source of most of their knowledge. Egyptian legends accredited the god Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. The Egyptian god of wisdom. Wait, Egyptian god of what? Wisdom. When you start your philosophy class, you know what philosophy means? Lover of wisdom. What did the Bible say about philosophy at the Pauline epistles? Beware of philosophy. All that is from Egypt. Egypt is the number one thing out of all the other nations that you're going to cover, which makes so much sense why God hates Egypt. All right. So, when we cover some things over here concerning about Egypt, about how they built their empire, what's kind of interesting is that there are some several things that can be said about some Egyptian artifacts or buildings. You want to hear this one. The Sphinx, the lion with the human head, right? Which figures so prominently in our vision of the Great Pyramid of Khufu, a.k.a. Cheops. Remember, that guy was supposedly the tyrannical leader that built all these Egyptian structures. Historians say that it must have been covered by sand for a long time because Herodotus, remember that's one of your historical, his, ancient historians, who recorded everything he saw, and he saw practically everything, what does he say? Does not mention it. The Her Herodotus didn't mention anything about that, where historians are saying, it must have been covered by sand for a long time. You know, so those wordings, it must, it should. You know, I think cannot prove that's yeah. why. Yeah. Historians say it was built in or around 2500 BC. Some legends of the Arabs say it was built before the Great Flood, and others give it an extremely long ago date for an ancient civilization of as much as 12,000 years. Pharaoh and Amenhotep II, in the middle of the second millennium BC, said the Sphinx was older than the pyramids. The inventory seal by August Marriott in 1857 speaks of how Pharaoh Khufu or Cheops, who is credited for the Great Pyramid of Giza, intended to excavate the already ancient Sphinx and restore it. How about that? Isn't that all very interesting? What they mention is that back then in Egypt, there must, there used to be a huge body of water. It was not Egypt. Which later on, that's why it became all a desert. Wait a minute. And then from this, uh, as this body of water gradually decreased, where did this large body of water come from? It was love. Amen. And then if the Sphinx was covered by that, and a lot of other important buildings, then guess what that means? This means that it's a strong possibility that the fallen angels were the ones who built, if not all, but at least some of the Egyptian.
all these. And then Satan wants to revive Egypt later on. They march back over there. Try to think about it. If it is done, if it isn't done by fallen angels before the flood, then the second option is it's got to be done by them, but not of their own ability. So how can they build these pyramids unless they were full of demon possession hmm. by the priests? And there are some interesting stuff where some Bible believers claim that they use some form of shamanism to build up the pyramids. Shamanism is another ancient religion that infected Asia, which we will cover later on, actually. All right, so another thing which uh, I'm going to read, if I have a little bit of time, I'm going to mention about the next two kingdoms quickly, and then shall we wrap it up? I don't want to leave you guys hanging. Who do you think Egypt worshipped as the number one creation, obviously? Um, yeah. Sun, sun, sun everywhere. And that was wrong. The next kingdoms is going to be Assyria and Babylon. You read Widowson's book, Assyria was known as kind of like Nazi Germany. They were one of the ones that built up a military might. That's why Jonah, who was preaching to Nineveh, did not want to preach at them. Why? They were brutal people. They did slaughters, inhuman slaughters of people. Some interesting things about the military might of Assyria. Now, Assyria, for some of you who don't know, is that their common language and arts came from Sumeria. See, Sumeria is a chief root that gave birth to the superpowers later on. Now what they mention over here is that Assyria grew out of the cities mentioned and the name of Shem's son. Although its predominant racial group may have been from mixture of Ham and Shem. The serious main god was Asher, builder of Nineveh. That's why God keeps condemning Nineveh. That's their main capital. Nina, a version of Ishtar, was also worshipped. No surprise there. During the time of Abraham's visit to Egypt, you know what they were doing? They were developing into a fierce nation, which one day a lot of people would fear. Here are some examples. The axe, the mace, the dagger, and finally the sword were added to the spear and the bow and arrow for warfare and hunting. The chariot was a small cart, usually lightweight, generally two-wheeled with sometimes four, sometimes armor and sometimes with sharp blades projecting from the axles and drawn by armored forces. How about that? Now, let's cover Babylonia. Remember, Hammurabi swallowed up Sumeria. And it's located near the Tigris and Euphrates today. And it's the rivers that water Sumeria, Akkad, and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So notice that Akkad is definitely uh, mentioned as one of the ancient kingdoms where Babylonia was conglomerated. Hammurabi is counted by traditional historians as the first great lawgiver and conqueror of note. You're going to notice that. The so-called code is found on one stone monument found at Susa and was a model of his idea of justice. But there is no evidence anywhere that this code was ever enforced as law by any court. That's kind of interesting. Uh, one side of the monument shows the king receiving the code from Shamash. What kind of creation god do you think he is? Again, the sun god. Everyone bows the sun. No wonder God says avoid the sun. Avoid the sun. Avoid the sun. Babylonians worship Ishtar, the goddess of immigrants and liberty, 
known as Astarte to the Greeks. And then he mentions a lot of other forms. Sacred prostitution, see, whoredoms, was vital part of Babylonian religion like Canaan. That's where that's why Canaan had a lot of sexual problems going on. So that's why it makes sense Revelation 17. God calls Babylon what the great whore of Revelation. Now, Babylon was looked down by Egypt as an inferior culture. And it is true, Babylon lacked the, the sophistication of Egypt. Which is why it makes sense in your King James Bible. The Antichrist headquarters Jerusalem, which is called Egypt. The Lord sees Rome, Babylon, as something separate. See, because the Antichrist chief uh, city is going to be spiritually called Egypt, which is supposedly superior to Babylon. But today, it's Babylon. Babylon has been ruling. So what do you think the elites are going to do to Babylon? They're going to betray her. Book of Revelation 17. She's burned up. How about that? Now that's Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham came from. Now, Let's wrap this up with Abraham and another interesting figure. In dispensationalism, we come to a different dispensation. What is it called? Human government. So the Lord put some rules in the book of Genesis when he spoke to Noah after the flood. If a man kills another man, his life will be compensated. Also, he mentioned not to eat the blood. So there are some form of codes and rules. Now notice that when mankind followed their own codes and rules, they failed that dispensation too. See this? It's a failure of following that dispensation for salvation. Because the code and all of governmental systems that's in grain, will come from Nimrod. Nimrod did a big bang up job right there. He did a big, big job where it just it just destroyed everything. So God has to have a different form of government. And he also realizes the rules are gonna to have to change. It's gonna be based on promise. So the human government he's going to use is Israel. He uses Abraham. And he came from where? The cream of the crop city that time. Ur. Ur. So God used Abraham from Israel to start his human government. But God did not lay the rules and the terms, although he did some. It's more of a promise rather than a nation. You know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what Paul argued. It's more based on promise. Because God realized, man, when they make their own rules and laws, it's a failure. So that's why the nation of Israel is important. If you mingle them with these guys, there's something demonic that's possessing you. And you better watch out for that stuff online. Amen. Now there's a second person which you probably didn't think about. You know who's the second significant person? The guy that the Lord raised up? Go. Mm -hmm. And guess where he was nearby? Urgh. See, while Satan's kingdom was growing, God had his own good guys that were still living right for the Lord. Go, he tried to live the best according to his conscience. Remember, that's the key dispensational ingredient, how people realize how they're saved, is by just following the best according to their conscience. God didn't make rules clear until the Mosaic Law, and then with the church age, he just disbanded it because man can't keep the whole law. But aside from that, Job, he came nearby this region and he was also, like Abraham, a powerful, rich person. But under his own, quote unquote, government and reign, being a powerful person, the Lord, what did he allow Satan to do? To take everything away from Job. Why? Because then these kingdoms can be more glorified. These people can be more looked up. 
just like today's modern century. They will only look up to you if you're educated, rich, and powerful, and prestigious, and successful. So God wanted to allow Satan to take all that away from Job. And you know what God thought, which Job realized? Despite of all these glory, I am nothing but what? Dust and ashes. I am nothing from God. So what God was trying to teach mankind during this wicked timeline was how did you grow in that with prosperity, education, and power? Is it not because of me? I did it all? So he proved that with Job. So that's why these two people are going to be the most important people during that timeline as the good guys. Before that timeline, it was Shem seed. But Shem seed was already messing up. And they're compromising with the superpower allies. Want, uh, last finale, and then we'll call it a uh, night for this service because this is very interesting. As you look at these three powers, they're going to be revived at the tribulation because there is an Antichrist whose city in Jerusalem in Revelation 11 is called Isaiah 10. He is known as Assyrian. In Revelation 17 has Babylon. Um, you see what Satan's trying to do? What men learn from history is that what? Men never learn from history. Yeah. Alright, let's close with a word of prayer. Your homework assignment will be posted at the end of this video. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings were appropriate to the hearers and increase our knowledge of the Spirit. And let's be careful of satanic devices and learn from our history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.